Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to this memorial and celebration of Jill Jolliffe's life and achievements. I'm Fiona Gruber, a mediumly old friend of Jill's, because I have only known her for 25 years, and lastly, uh, my husband and Brady and I were Jill's guardians. And I don't know how delighted she'd be for everybody be here to be here tonight. She'd also want to take part, I think. She'd be really happy and a bit shy. Now, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are standing on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation, unceded land, and I pay respects, we all pay respects, to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And a welcome to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and everybody here tonight. Jill was a fantastic person, we know that. She was a friend to many of you. She was a colleague, an esteemed colleague. To some, she was a great hero. To the East Timorese community, she kept that struggle alive in her writing, her incandescent writing, for decades. And we all owe her a huge debt, not just the East Timorese, but for everybody who believes in justice and human rights and fairness. We all owe Jill a huge debt. I won't go on because we have a wonderful array of speakers tonight. And, um, but I will say thank you to everybody who helped organise this before we begin. John Milkins, Greg Cunningham, Anne Cunningham, Mark William, Mark Williams, Anne Brady, Jim Brady, and Gil Santos, the committee who organised this event. But without further ado, I'd, and also Javita who made them food, um, we've got about 40 minutes of talk. Um, we are going to be hearing from journalists, politicians, um, old friends, rat bags from the Monash days, a whole range of people. And I will say, if anyone's here from ASIO, you don't have to declare yourself, but you would be delighted. <laughs> but first of all, I'd like to introduce via video from East Timor, His Excellency Shanana Gushmal. First President of Timor Leste and former Prime Minister. Oh. It is with great sadness that we learn about the passing of Ms. Chief Jolie, a distinguished journalist, political activist, and fighter for justice in Timor Leste. Jill was a hero for the Timorese people. She was in Timor Leste in September 1975, where she witnessed incursions of Indonesian soldiers into our country. In October 1975, she reported on the murder of her colleagues, Australian based journalist, Greg Shackleton, Larry Kuninga. Tony Stewart, Malcolm Jenny, and Brian Peters by the Indonesian military at Balibo on 15, 1975. Jill was in the Indian to report on the proclamation of the independence on 28 November 1975. She took photos of our leaders, including President Nikola Lovato which will forever be placed as an iconic image of our nation. She lived in Portugal for 20 years, where she was a tireless activist for the Timorese cause and worked to expose the horrors of our occupation in the world. She died in 1994 and undertook a constant journey deep into the mountains, to track down an interview with distant leader, Conis Santana. An interview with Conis rather exposed the human rights abuses in our country. She had dedicated her life to investigating the deaths of, of the Volleyball Five and the Australian journalist Roger East, who was murdered at the building of the waterfront at the beginning of the Indonesian invasion. After the restoration of our independence, Jill continued to fight for Timor Leste, 
incluindo o Clarão e o Campeão, que eles já estão em uma diversidade. Muito caso da Fai, de Fogue, dividimos o projeto. A vida é a época. Veja o testemunho de Felipe de Maurício Prisoners e de todos os salvadores. Muito caso de um fotinho. She was very disappointed, a world is making the most of the world of Sudan in the world. Jim, who was an activist, a rebel, a fighter, at great cost to herself, she exposed the reality of the Indonesian military occupation and supported the struggle of the world people. She will always have a special place in our national history. She is one of us. Sorry about the sound quality. I can guarantee that our next speaker, Steve Brass, will sound much louder. <laughs> Please welcome Steve Back, former Premier of Victoria and Chair of the Balibo House of Trust. Thanks very much. Could I'd also um, like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And also the, the families of the Balibo Five here with us tonight, Greg Cunningham, Anne Cunningham, John Milkins and Paulie Stewart. And John, who's the chair of the Belbo Trust, I'm the patron as well. So that's okay, but I, I don't want to take your job, uh, John. <laughs> I think it's, it's great. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the late Shelley Shackleton, who died in January, having given, um, having never given up her quest to find justice and truth for what happened in Timor. Um, friends, as Janana said, Jill was an activist, a rebel and a fighter. She endured a traumatic childhood and adolescence. Her academic brilliance was her salvation, winning her a Commonwealth Scholarship to Monash University in the early 1970s. Monash was in the centre of progressive politics and Jill loved it. And I think there's some people here from Monash who remember that activism and were involved too. She, jo she joined the indomitable Jean McLean in the anti-Vietnam War campaign. That meant, meant like Jean, Jill became an ASIO target. Her ASIO file eventually ran to four volumes. <laughs> Actually, a very mundane detail. Uh, the pivotal moment of Jill's life, her sliding doors moment, was her decision to accept an invitation from Joseph Harris Horta to join a Franklin and UDT sponsored delegation to East Timor in March 1975, representing then the Australian Union of Students, the AUS. As Jill recalls in her autobiography, the organisers were having difficulty finding a student who wanted to go. I put up my hand, beginning a life-changing relationship with the luckless half, uh, half island. It was the decision that led her to fall in love with Timor, become a foreign correspondent, live in Portugal for two decades, and be lauded, as we've heard from Janet Guzmao, as a hero of Timor-Leste. Jill wrote a report for the AUS about that first visit to Timor-Leste. She opened with, one, one does not need to smoke marijuana to get high in East Timor. <laughs> the country is unspeakably beautiful. That first visit was during the brief period of the Franklin UDT Alliance. <coughs> the report obviously reflects the optimism of the time, very short lived. Jill returned to Timor Leste in September 1975 as a correspond correspondent. This was just after the August UDT coup and ensuing, and ensuing violence. The events she witnessed during her three month stay and the people she met had a lifelong impact. Jill is well known to this audience, staying at the Hotel Turismo with the Bellavo 5 journalists. She and Tony Maniati were the only international journalists left in Dili when the news drifted in that Greg Shackleton, Gary Cunningham, Tony Stewart, Malcolm Rennie and Brian Peters were missing. Jill's first job as a foreign correspondent was to report their deaths. 
Jill made it her life mini a mission to discover the truth about what happened in Belbo, to debunk the propaganda and the lies coming from the Indonesian militia uh, mil and military and the Australian government. She interviewed hundreds of refugees in camps in Portugal to piece together what really happened in Belbo on the 16th of October 1975. Jill made the Timorese cause her own. In 1994, she became only the second journalist to interview a Timorese guerrilla leader. Robert Dom was the first. He interviewed Janana in 1990. After Janana's capture in 1992, Kona Santana took over the resistance leadership on the ground. Jill risked her life to meet with him. Her interviews and photographs confirming the resistance was still fighting and the war was not over, made the front page of the age newspaper. Still wanting to do more, Jill went back with a Dutch filmmaker. This time they were caught by Indonesian forces before they reached Timor Leste. Undeterred and unable to risk entering Indonesia again, Jill commissioned a camera operator to undertake the journey. The result was the blockade. That aired on SBS television in 1997. By then, the momentum was building for independence. Jill Jolliffe did more than any other journalist to chronicle the Indonesian invasion and Timor Leste's fight for independence. We can only wonder and speculate how history would have played out had Jill not put up a hand to go on that first AUS trip to Timor. Friends, it's impossible to do justice to Jill's incredible meaning of meaningful life in a five-minute speech. Her copious papers and electronic records are held at the National Library of Australia. There is an extraordinary biography begging to be written. Please, someone, do it. Jill's story should be known and celebrated by all Australians. She was a fearless journalist and a tra trailblazing feminist. And as Janana Guzmau said, she is a hero to the Timorese. I look forward to the day when Jill Joloff is proudly recognised as a hero in Australia too. Thank you very much indeed, Steve. I'd like now to invite Mark Baker, a former Fairfax editor and editor or a publisher of Inside Stories, to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Fiona. Um, before I say anything, I'd like to say that uh, what a fantastic job Fiona uh, and her friends and family have done, did for Jill in the final years of her life and have done for Jill since her death, and I think it's outstanding. Thank you, Fiona. Um, and thank you for inviting me to speak to, uh, to say a few words tonight. Uh, about Jill the journalist, although Steve uh, has <coughs> fantastically summarised the high points of her career already, um, but it's an honour for me to sort of step, step into that space and say a little more on that subject. Um, I knew Jill for more than 30 years as a fellow foreign, foreign correspondent in the field and as an author at, uh, and as an editor at The Age and later at the Canberra Times. And for both uh, newspapers she wrote some uh, very, very important stories. Um, Jill was an exceptional journalist in exceptional circumstances. She never trained formally as a journalist and, to my knowledge, never worked in a structured newsroom. She was an activist who stumbled into journalism as a means of highlighting and advancing the cause to which she dedicated most of her life, the cause of Timorese independence. The purists would, ab would abhor this career pathway. Real journalists are supposed to be even-handed apolitical, detached, dispassionate. They should be an arm's length from the story, never part of it. And God forbid they must never be a player. I say, bullshit. <laughs> the best journalism is about exposing wrong, revealing what the powerful want hidden, giving voice to those who, who, are, who are unable to be heard, and revealing truths to those who are ignorant of them or who would choose to deny them. On each of these scores, Jill Jolliffe excelled as a journalist. As we have heard, a visit to Timor-Leste uh, with the ANU delegation in, the early, in early 75 was the hook that drew Jill into a lifetime of crusading journalism. 
She witnessed the first incursions, as Steve said, by Indonesian troops into Timor in September 75, uh, or was October 75, along with Michael Richardson, the long, long time Southeast Asia correspondent of the Asian newspaper who became an early mentor, journalistic mentor. Uh, and later she reported on the, uh, the murder, the murders of the Balbo Five. The reporting played an important part in drawing the world's attention to those outrageous events in 1975. But even more important was her tenacious work over the years that followed to expose the truth of the Balibo killings and the death of Roger East and the shameful response of the Australian government to the invasion and to the murders. We remember Jill most of all for her outstanding work on Timor-Leste, both on the ground and in the years that she was based in Portugal. But she achieved much more in her long career as a foreign correspondent. She covered wars in, in Angola and Western Sahara, wrote about secret Nazi gold hoards in Portugal, and documented the sex trade, uh, sex slave trade in Europe. Jill had the purest of journalistic hearts. Unlike so many others, she was not about igniting herself, or making money, or engaging in the petty rivalries that consume so many in the craft. She was passionate, relentless, and driven to make a difference on big issues that she believed mattered. She could, of course, at times be a pain in the arse. <laughs> she was stubborn, could be cranky, and sometimes a push. But in my experience, that was usually born of her frustration and impatience at obstacles in the way of her getting the story out and getting the job done. And she was seriously brave, as Steve has mentioned, knowing better than anyone how Indonesian soldiers slaughtered the Balibo Five, she chose to trek into the mountains of Timor-Leste in 94 for a clandestine meeting with uh, Kona Santana. Uh, in 2019, I left uh, the Melbourne Press Club after serving 10 years as the club's president and CEO. In that time, I helped create the Australian Media Hall of Fame to honour the greatest men and women of our craft over the past two centuries. If I was still involved, it would be a high priority to see Jill Jolliffe indicted, uh, inducted, I should say. <laughs> well, one thing at a time. Uh, into that Hall of Fame. Um, but in my mind, she's already there. Um, among the, that group of greats that helped shape modern Australia, and particularly among those whose work stood for the best of what we can and should be as a nation. Um, he repeated it again tonight, but in a fine tribute uh, that Shanana gave uh, soon after Jill died, uh, a com he paid a compliment that I think would have thrilled Jill when he said simply, as he said again tonight, uh, she was one of us. Um, if I may borrow from that and speak for other Australian journalists, I would say she was one of the best of us. Bye, Jill. The film director, Rob Connolly, planned to be here tonight, but unfortunately he can't be. He's very sorry that he recorded this message for us. Hi, I'm Robert Connolly, and I'm incredibly sorry to not be there today to celebrate the life of Jill Jolliffe, exceptional life. I first met Jill when we approached her to option her book, Cover Up, a phenomenal work of investigative journalism. And it became the basis for our film Balibo and was later republished as the book Balibo. I'm sure many of you have read much of Jill's writing since then too, as she wrote also about her own personal experience growing up and the various factors that informed who she was. Um, but today I'd particularly like to reflect on her work with the Living Memory Project. It was on my first trip to East Timor that she introduced me to these incredible interviews that she'd done with women. Part of a truth and reconciliation process, uh, an exceptional body of work um, that gave a voice to people that hadn't had a voice. And I think among the many great triumphs of Jill's life, the Living Memory Project is one that is extraordinary. Uh, I really wish I could be there with you all today to, to celebrate Jill a friend, um, an incredible journalist, a fierce intellect, and someone who fought time and time again 
uh, to tell the stories of those that didn't have a voice, more unable to tell their stories themselves. Um, I look forward to hearing about the day and, and wish you all well. Um, we're now going back in time, we're now going back to those rat bag days of the early 70s when Jill was a firebrand at Monash University and if you look at that board over there you will see a little poster, love me I'm from Monash, if you look closely Jill's brandishing a rifle, I don't think she knew how to shoot it but I think she liked the idea of being, you know, she'll get your gun. Um, we've all been young once, and she was fiercely, fiercely uh, left-wing at that time, and always, in fact, but very much at that time. A couple of people from those days, Mark Rowell, uh, who was uh, a buddy of Jill's, is going to speak now, and I believe someone else. I've uh, forgotten their name, but they came up to me. Sorry, Jean McLean, sorry. It's also going to say a few words. So bring it on, comrades. Well, I hope you've got your glasses raised, because Jill would like them raised. <laughs> now, I'm Margrell, and I I'm speaking on behalf of fellow art students, Sandra Beaton and Gillian Tadish, me Murray, who are sitting on the couch. Well, sitting there, and Mike Toole and myself, who were medical students, and Mike's down there. We were just a few of the many, many, many friends and renegades of Jill during those heady days of the 60s at Monash. Jill was feisty when in 1963 she arrived at Monash, known as the farm, it was very muddy, <laughs> and there were lots of mud. Jill was small in stature, but very large in energy. This was a time when there was increasing momentum for all kinds of change, social and political, and of course the Vietnam War, which sparked a lot of us into varying degrees of action. We all bonded early on some with a shared experience of estrangement from their families. Jill didn't talk much about her childhood, except that she'd had a very unpleasant family. Gillian Tadish recalls a visit down to Barn Heads to see if Jill could borrow some money, and there they met the singularly unpleasant stepfather, Hines, an awful, awful man. <laughs> However, I don't know if she got any money. In all this time, Jill never mentioned she had been adopted. In retrospect, we understand the sense we had then of a profound sadness in her life. Studies were not a high priority, and after failing first year, Sandra and Jill lost their student incomes, and Jill and had many part-time jobs, shared houses, and stays with friends at Glen Iris and Warren Hyde. Parties and political discourse with hopes of revolution preoccupied us, along with some of our studies. There were many, many parties at various places, including Hilltop Avenue, Glen Iris, a student household over the years, from 1996, with various friends of the library basement group. There was a lot of drinking. Flagons of claret, you know, those glass flagons in the 60s. Beer and bad behaviour. Not PC these days. Including burning an effigy of a Victorian Premier after the hanging of Ryan. <laughs> and dancing after the then Prime Minister danced. Jill had a wry sense of humour and drinking continued to be a favourite pastime. Michael recalls in Lisbon, not many years after Portugal had lost its, all its colonies, Jill delighted in taking him to several cafes to gloat at the miserable looking ex-colonists <laughs> 
wearing blue tinted glasses and pinky diamond rings. <laughs> also in Oporto, spending an afternoon in a tiny bar drinking numerous glasses of the famous local port. After a memorable ha hangover, Michael has never touched port again. <laughs> In 1968, Jill's political activism took centre stage and she established in Greville Street, Paran, the Alice's Restaurant Bookshop, named after Arlo Guthrie's famous song. This was a meeting and party place for her activism and collection of cats. The cats were so numerous that Jill asked Cat Protection Society to rehome them. Much later, in life, she still found comfort with cats, and we saw that on one of the photos. And it was lovely to know that she still had cats in her life. After she left for Portugal, there was not much communication except for the odd journalist who Jill would send to us, arriving somewhat bewildered and confused about where and how. On returning to Darwin, we heard more from her, and following her return to Melbourne, we had a lot more contact. Jill was clearly smart, thoughtful, challenging the status quo, and as a student was searching for her way in the world. Thank you, Jill, for all your activism and advocacy, for Timor Leste, women and children. Then I do, Jill. Bon dia, hello everyone. I'm Marion Kaplan. Jill was my best friend, my closest buddy in Portugal, and now we are long apart, and she is now the late. I still carry on, not very well, very peacefully, I'm at my house in France, very rural, which I like. Um, but I think of her because she came here too. Uh, and it was bliss and totally apart from what she and I did in Portugal. She did lots of stories and I did lots of photos because that was my rule. I was a photojournalist there. And I lived in Alfama, so did she. So we were often together when I was in Lisbon. And I miss her then, and I miss her now, and it's a tragedy that she died young, but she achieved a great deal. Among them, her books, the famous Balibo, Run For Your Life, and Cover Up, the story of the Balibo Five, of which I'm very proud to own these. And I did my, my books too, quite different ones. And uh, this is meant to be a tribute to Jill, a memorial to Jill. And I'm so sorry I'm not with you, but I'm with you all in spirit and with her. Bye-bye. Jill moved to Portugal in 1978 to continue reporting on East Timor from its former colonial ruler. Portuguese troops had abandoned the territory four years previously after the right-wing regime in Lisbon was brought down in a coup that brought back democracy. Living in the Graça district of Lisbon, overlooking the red rooftops of the old city, Jill was admired here as a committed and courageous journalist who dedicated her life to fighting injustice. As well as working tirelessly in support of the people of East Timor and their struggle for independence, she also reported on oppression, corruption and the ill treatment of the poor and powerless in Portugal, Angola and other Portuguese-speaking countries. East Timor was a burning issue for the Portuguese people and Jill's authoritative reporting and resolute questioning of those in authority earned her deep respect here as she fought 
to ensure that Timor was never forgotten or neglected. I first got to know Jill when I was a fledgling freelance reporter and greatly valued her friendship. Always supportive and generous, she encouraged me to contact US newspapers and offer stories on Timor. She shared her wide knowledge of a glass of red wine and brought back gifts for our daughters from her travels. As well as a journalist who fought unflaggingly for justice, Jill will be remembered by her many friends and colleagues here and in the rest of the world as a warm, witty and independent woman who made a real difference in the world and left it a better place. Jill Jolliffe, the immortal, uh, unsinkable, uh, unique, and uh, on occasionally delightful, on occasional delightfully frightening uh, Jill Jolliffe, soulmate of mine. We met and uh, set our friendship on the right course in uh, Estoril at the Flounder Inn. I believe it was called Founders Inn, but uh, Jill and I floundered in. I do remember the two of us in Luanda trying to make it to the government store to buy some uh, some uh, Havana Club uh, rum. You know, we needed it for sustenance. I also remember Jill on that trip uh, to Angola when we came under fire. We were at the southernmost, uh, the southeasternmost, I guess, uh, um, uh, position of the FAPLAS, the uh, Angolan government forces, during the Civil War. Uh, we came under fire uh, in name only from UNITA. It was really the South Africans firing G6s. But uh, Jill, oh my goodness, Jill, uh, Jill and me uh, falling down the stairs because we'd been imbibing too heavily at uh, the Stax Volt Review in um, Lisbon at the Coliseo. Uh, Georges Freire and his wife and daughter uh, disapproving mightily of our behavior. Uh, what can I say? Uh, Jill, uh, uh, inimitable, uh, immortal, precious, beloved, and also the author of these things. There, this one here and uh, this one here. Uh, I have some lovely photographs of Jill uh, running uh, across a, a partly blown out bridge in Angola when we were under fire. But uh, Jill, we love you. We miss you. Life is not the same. <laughs> Thank you for everything. Lots of love. We are actually going to Portugal later this year, and I think I might have to get drunk with that guy. Um, <laughs> I'd like now to invite um, the relatives of some of the Balabo Pi to step up. Um, Greg. Simon, Anne, his sister, John, Milkins, if you'd like to say a few words. Um, before we start, we're all supposed to be in someone else called Paul Stewart here. I hear you. Um, but he injured himself, so we can't uh, get him. So unfortunately, he was happy just to come. Um, but also, I'd like to acknowledge another person here in the Audience, a lady called Janine De Beer, who's sitting here in the corner. She was engaged to Brian Peters at the time. Okay. So um, make sure that we're here. Um, you're saying words, or are you saying first? So uh, Paulie was going to read a poem that Annie Stewart wrote for, for Jill, and Anne is now going to, to read it on the Stewart's behalf. Thanks for that. I didn't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a homage to Jill. It's actually written by uh, Annie Stewart. Near the roundabout at the bottom end of town, a tree of knowledge, sentinel to men's wisdom. Nearby, a new bench laments women's stories of sorrow, shrouded in grief and trauma, memorial to forced adoptions. An old lady sits there, white helmet hair, silent stone sculpture, head hung in despair. Is she thinking of her baby? Flashback to Dilly, 
at the long lunch where I strain to hear your story. Snatch conversations I hear vanish and adopted. I watched you walk away arm in arm with my mum, small women, heads together. Were you sharing the pain of your primal wound, stolen from your birth mother, dazed by childhood violence, a survivor pegged as rebel, misfit, run for your life, you wrote. The battlefields of life's wars, pale crucible to your beginnings, a warrior for truth and justice, fierce war correspondent. You nunched the turismo, told them it was bush warfare, warned, keep your heads down. After all the years, it was you who uncovered the Balbo truth. Mum loved you for that. So, I'm John Milkins, the son of Gary Cunningham, um, with my uncle <coughs> and my son being here tonight. I want to just to share some personal reminiscences of Jill because you've heard how brave she was, but in writing cover up, Jill uncovered my life. I was adopted when I was six weeks old and I didn't know who my birth parents were. When I was 20, I met my birth mother and she told me about my father, Gary Cunningham. I was very surprised I'd just been studying that in a politics class at uni, so it was quite weird to be drawn into a world that I didn't know much about, but became very angry about very quickly because it became more than just our five relatives I learned about what had happened in China and was continuing to happen. When Jill wrote Cover Up, she wanted to tell the story of the families, <coughs> not of the political intrigue. And that's all I had to read to understand the geopolitics, the way nations do things to each other without regard to their peoples. Jill told me my story. And she had a certain intensity when we spoke. I didn't know then that she too was adopted. We talked about danger. And indeed, in North Melbourne, in Errol Street, when she was interviewing me for some of the for cover up. She'd come down to have a coffee with, with me. I lived in North Melbourne as well, and she'd been staying with Anne and Jim Brady. And I remember something strange happened. Jill had forgotten her wallet, and I had to live late for my story to understand what my other life might have been. When she got back, Jill rang in great distress. The house had been broken into. Only her room, and only the only thing taken was her laptop with all of her notes. Her wallet was left on the bed untouched. We don't know if ASIO were perhaps trying to get out the fire. <coughs> Another time where Jill was incredibly brave was when she was supporting the witnesses to the coronial inquiry. Very, very brave people themselves. Jill was determined that their safety was paramount. And as she was researching who they were and how they could be protected, she went to West Timor. In her book, Home for Your Life, she mentions being approached by a man in West Timor, around a fountain in West Timor, who pulled aside his jacket and showed a pistol and said, do you know who I am? I'm Christopher de Silva, one of the Balbo five alleged murderers you need to go back over the border or you could be next. Jill was incredibly strong and dedicated to the end of her life. Um, for, to, to support others and to fight for justice, even when she was in the nursing home. Thank you for those of you who, who visited her and, and supported her in the end of, at the end of her life. She was still trying to radicalise the residents and bring <laughs> <laughs> The final thing I wanted to say is that not only Jim, Jill's memory, but for our relatives, and because we are still in debt to the people of Timor, we haven't stopped. We're looking forward in our work in the Trust, but we haven't stopped as a family in searching for justice. 
it may not be ready even after 50 years because I have the time to cover those documents that His Excellency Jasper and the called to be released just recently at Shirley Shackleton's class. It may not be my son, but he won't stop being there.
she just suddenly said, I'm all right. Those were her last words. They're pretty good words. We know that Jill was more than all right. She was brilliant. And to finish, I think we should listen to Jill's voice. Thank you. To look at the complacency in Australia, both among the government and the people, it would be hard to imagine that a vicious, bloody war was underway in our nearest neighbour. East Timor, a short while ago a sleepy Portuguese colonial backwater, is fighting for its survival as an independent nation. Under Portuguese rule, before the 1974 revolution in Portugal, little or no political activity was allowed in East Timor. But with the birth of left-wing government in Lisbon, things also changed in the colonies. Jill Jolliffe, a journalist, was living in Dili at the critical time after the revolution in Portugal and saw how Fretlin came to take power. And what sort of atmosphere was there in Dili at that stage? Well, uh, I'd say that there was a very fine, a very happy sort of atmosphere because the Portuguese had finally left and they'd been occupying East Timor for 400 years. The Timorese at last felt that they could organise their own situation. They'd organised two creches and childcare and they were looking into their own culture which had been suppressed for a long time and organising literacy programs and writing Timorese poetry and nationalist songs. Jill, welcome to the Conversation Hour. Thank you, John. You don't give up, do you? <laughs> no, not easily. Why not? Well, because I think an injustice is an injustice and it doesn't change with time. And people need to be brought to account. We all can those fireworks. It's quite amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we actually do have a, a, an announcement that um, I think you'd like to make. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose Pierce. I'm one of the community coordinators of MeTech. So MeTech is the Melbourne East Timorese Activity Centre. This is the space that we. Uh, meet, we hold uh, gatherings here uh, first Friday of every month. Uh, we're sponsored by the city of Yarra and Belgian neighborhood house. So when, when Jill contacted me uh, a few months ago about uh, the possibility of uh, participating and hosting uh, this event, to remember uh, Jill Joff, it, it was definitely a, an honor uh, uh, to be able to participate in that uh, for the Timorese community and for those the younger Timorese too to also come and, and learn about Jill, learn about uh, the work that she's done from uh, for this team. Um, Jill's uh, contribution to his team, as has been documented here, to me, is uh, immense. And we, uh, as Shalana said, she is uh, one of us. Um, for the families of the Volleyball Five, we would like to include that uh, them as well. We like to think as a community that they are somewhere uh, in Mount Matapian mountains of the soul, where we believe that our spirits will go and that they would watch over us and their families. So with that I say, thank you very much for being here today. Now please mingle and please eat heartily because we have lots of lovely food which has been made lovingly by Javita who makes all the food these two rooms. Thank you very much, everybody.